Give me ears to hear when you're speaking. Give me eyes to see as you move. You made these hands to use for your glory. Set my feet to carry your tree. Rain down, rain down, heaven come and cover this earth. Fall on good ground, good ground, we don't want to waste your word. When your truth is hard to believe in, let our hearts be soft for receiving. Fall on good ground, good ground. Make us good ground.
morning. Hey. It's good to hear the people of God coming in and uh, just fellowshipping together. We're going to get started here. Um, I just want to welcome you to Cedar Crest Bible Fellowship Church. Many of you are returning after 40 years, still coming back. Thank you for that. Uh, but some of you are new, and I just want to say to you, uh, no matter what you're bringing in, no matter who you are, um, this is the right place to be this morning. Um, God is calling us to worship him. He knows exactly what we need, and he can give that to us. So it's a good day to worship our creator. Thank you for joining us uh, as we do that this morning. Uh, if you are new to our gathering, we would love to get to know you a little bit and to share what God is doing in and through his people here at Cedar Crest Bible Fellowship Church. So if you reach into the pew back in front of you, there's a little card. If you'd like, you can fill that out and bring it to the Connect Center after the service. We have a little gift for you. And again, we just love to get to know you and to share what's going on here. Uh, additionally, you can join us for Pizza with the Pastors after next Sunday's service out in the hub. So next week after the service, if you're still new, still coming around, uh, some of our staff will be out there just to meet you and informally get to know you. Two weekends from now, uh, we'll be celebrating the Easter season, and two important dates for you to know are March 29th, 6.30 p.m., that's our Good Friday service, and then that Easter Sunday, the 31st, we have two services, 8.30 a.m., 10.30 a.m. Nursery is available for both of those, uh, but our regular children's ministries, Skyrocket, Blast Off, will only be available during the 8.30 service. Uh, I'd also encourage you to invite people uh, this Easter season to come to church. Uh, we have cards that are out at the promo table and welcome center um, with all that information that you can hand out to the people in your circles. Uh, and I've been praying this week that as we do that, um, you know, as we invite people to church, whether that invitation is accepted or denied, uh, that it would just open up the door to have a conversation about this good news that we have to share, that God is uh, working in our lives, that he loves us, that he wants to redeem us and reconcile us and whoever you're sharing that with, he wants to reconcile them to himself. Um, so we hope that you'll take advantage of some of these extra things that we're doing uh, as we continue to walk with the Lord together. Another one of those little extra things is uh, our DI, Discipleship Institute. This is our version of Sunday School. Um, we have really great teachers who are you know, wanting to apply the Bible in really practical ways to our lives. Um, so we're finishing up our winter courses now on March 24th, but we start our spring courses on the 7th. Um, so you can sign up for that, cedarcrest.church slash di. Uh, and for more information about any of those things, you can check our bulletin or the website. Uh, but now we're going to watch a short video about uh, the ministry to men. And their annual getaway. Well, the men's getaway is just an awesome time for guys to... A couple of things. We get into the Word of God together. I mean, just enjoy our time together. We uh, great activities. If you're a gun enthusiast, there's an opportunity for you to um, do some shooting. Um, otherwise, just hang out with the guys, frisbee, whatever. But it's really a good time just to get to know other guys in the church and dig into the Word of God together. There's something for everybody. So most guys think, do I like camping? Do I like, you know, shooting guns? Do I like fishing? There's more than just that, and the fellowship is probably the best fellowship that I have with men all year, so it's, it's an event that I always prioritize. You should come to the men's getaway because it's a wonderful time of getting to know uh, other believers in the church, praying for one another, encouraging one another, hearing men's testimonies. Uh, I always come away feeling very encouraged. Well, I always sleep in a tent, so for me, you know, I love tents, but I hear the cabins are nice too. I can attest the cabins are nice. There's mattresses in there. I don't like to sleep on the ground. So yes, amen, Jerry, it's right. <laughs> so you, know, you don't have to rough it if you don't want to. Uh, you know, on behalf of the men's ministry leadership team, we'd like to invite all you men to this year's men's getaway. I don't know many, how many years it's been now. It's uh, eight, nine, 10 years we've been doing it. And the size of the group just grows every year, but it's a great time to get away and have some fellowship with one another. You know, it's hard to get to know each other here on a Sunday morning sometimes when you're just passing each other. But at the getaway, you have an opportunity to spend time with one another. 
catching up or meeting new friends. I have to tell you, that's one of the things I look forward to and a couple of guys on the video said is, you'll get to know men in the church much better at the getaway than you might be able to here on a Sunday morning. So I would encourage you, if you've not been before, sign up. It's coming up really soon. So it's May 31st, it's a Friday. We get together on Friday evening and it runs through that Sunday morning, June 2nd. Registration actually opens today. So I'd encourage you to register for the event. You can do that by, a, you can have a QR code in your bulletin you can scan. You can go to the church website, Dwight Richards, uh, who's on our leadership team, is going to be out at the table out there, and you can sign up uh, through that as well. And one of the other things I just want to share with you is our speaker this year. So last year we had a speaker, Lincoln Fitch, who brought great words to us during our time of fellowshipping together. This year, Randy Grossman, who's a pastor from our Grace BFC Church in Reading, is going to be our speaker, and he's going to kick off a time of sharing with us is what role does prayer have in your life as a Christian man? Uh, and we all know how important prayer is. Well, Randy's going to go deeper into that and talk to us about the role of prayer in our walk as men of God. So again, I would encourage you to participate and encourage you to sign up. And uh, I think once you do, if you've not been before, you'll come back year after year. So I look forward to that. Thanks, Greg. Good morning. Uh, if you're able, I invite you to stand with us as we begin our time of worship and song. I'm going to read to us from Psalm 30, and then when the text turns yellow, uh, I invite you to read with me. The Lord has lifted us out of the depths and has not let our enemy gloat over us. When we've called to him for help, he has healed us. Sing the praises of the Lord, you his faithful people. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Let's read this together. Our hearts will sing your praises and not be silent. Lord, our God, we will praise you forever. Let's praise him. Still my 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of his glorious grace. What can wash away my sin? 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. for the blood. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood applied. Thank you, Jesus, it has washed me white. Thank you, Jesus, you have saved my life, brought me from the darkness into glory. Life. Sing glory to his name. Glory to his name. Glory to his name. There to my heart was the blood of morning, I want to get the truth of the word into me before I read any texts or look at any emails or let the news into me. I want God to be the first person to speak. Even before my sin rises up and starts to tell me to do this or that or feel this way, I want to let God speak to me first thing. And this week, one of these days, it was like one or two o'clock in the afternoon. I hadn't done it yet. I just, every time I opened my Bible, I felt like, ah, oh, man, I don't want to do this. And I sat there and I had to ask myself, Why? Why do I feel this way? Why am I running from what satisfies? This gives joy. This gives peace. I'm seeking satisfaction. This is what actually satisfies. We're just going to sing this next song. And a friend of mine shared that struggle with 
with me one time and he said, I don't, I don't feel like I can sing these words that my soul longs after God. I don't feel that in me. I'm longing after all these other things. So I want to speak to you if you're in that position, this position that I was in this week. We were created to worship. We were created to exalt. We long to make much of something. And even people who aren't Christians, they're longing to make much of the best thing, the thing that can actually hold the weight of their longing, the thing that can hold the weight of their adoration, the thing that's actually worthy of making much of. And so as we sing this song, if you feel like, man, I I don't long after God, you can objectively say, God, my soul does long after you. I'm filling my soul with all sorts of other things, but I'm longing after you. You are what satisfies. And as we get later in the song, and it does talk about how I want you more than gold or silver, it gets a little more subjective. We can sing that in faith and say, Lord, I know this is where I'm supposed to be. I'm not right now. But I trust that someday you're going to make me like that. Lord, would you make me to want you? Make me to see that you really satisfy. So that, God, I would give you the glory by choosing you above all else. Let's just sing this together. As the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. Jesus 
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. so closely, the things that we cling to so that we can cling on to Him. And we can do that with confidence because we know that His power and love were enough to overcome man, to overcome Satan, to overcome death. We can do that with confidence because we know that He loves us. We know that He works all things together for the good of those who love Him. We know what the ending is. We know that He's coming back. We know that sin is defeated. We know that death dies. So we commit to him, let's sing, I will build my life upon your love. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be. Sing, we will build. Calafia. You haven't forgotten. That's good morning in the language of the K people. You know who the K people are, right? So keep praying for them. Your response would be Calafie. <laughs> you can tell I've been talking with Alex lately. Anyway, uh, this morning let's start by reading a short little passage from Job, Job 38, 1 through 7, and then I'm going to jump to chapter 40. 38, 1 through 7 says this, <clears throat> Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Dress for action like a man. I will question you, and you make it known to me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? 
Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? You can read all of 38 and 39. And then in chapter 40, 1 through 5, it says this. The Lord said to Job, Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? He who argues with God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I have spoken once, and I will not answer twice, but I will proceed no further. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you this morning in the name of of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray today as a church body, your bride who recognizes that you alone are holy, you are creator, you are wholly different than we are, Lord. We acknowledge and confess our smallness, our inability to be or to do anything worthwhile outside of your sovereign grace. So what can we do other than bow before you in worship and adoration? We love you, Lord. Father, our needs are many. Some of our number are suffering, Lord, with various illnesses. Some will have surgery. Some are grieving losses. We ask for your help in these things, Lord. Even this morning, I just heard that Ernie Menicelli went to the hospital with heart issues. Lord, would you be with him right now? Father, would you be with us? Job said, we are of small account. But you say in Ezekiel 17, I am the Lord. I have spoken and I will do it. Lord, will you do it? Will you please help your people? We ask you, Lord, to do this according to your perfect will. And we will thank you for the result because we know it's for our good and for your glory, Lord. We want to thank you for giving us leaders in the church, under shepherds and benevolent servants, men you have called to lead and to serve your church. We want to pray for them this morning, Lord. Thank you for giving us Pastor Chris and our deacon, John Ulysne, pray for them. Protect them, Lord. Watch over their families. Keep them in the palm of your hand and use them for the glory of your name and for the good of your people. We pray also for Hannah Waterman, our college student of the week. Oh, Lord, would you keep her strong in faith? Our academic institutions are not always gospel-friendly, Lord. So be with her. Watch over her. We want to pray for our brother, Pastor Ron Mahurin, who led this church well for so many years. Even though he's listed as homebound, we're happy to see him often here in our worship services. Lord, we also want to pray for our brother, Alex Hartraft, who's right now serving you diligently in Chad. Lord, he asks that we pray for you to soften the hearts of those trapped in Islam during this month of Ramadan as they fast and seek for righteousness that we know can only come from a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. We pray for Alex's language helper, who he calls Clyde, and the landlord that they broke the fast with just the other day. We pray, Lord, that you provoke deep thought and questions in their heart that they might seek after you. Lord, we pray also for this discipleship group that Alex is leading. May it bear much fruit for your kingdom. And Father, I pray, especially for Alex right now, that you would make his body resilient during this hot season. Lord, give him grace and help him as he walks in you in your spirit, serving you in such a, a dry and hot place. Lord, we love you and we, we thank you for this time to pray together as a church. 
And we pray these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Brother Hoy. You allow me the pleasure to, pleasure to pray for you? Please. Let's pray for our brother. Oh Lord, we bow again before you. Acknowledge your sovereign control over our lives, your sovereign work in our brother Jason as he diligently studied this week, Lord, the hours that he put in delving into your word, Lord, studying it with all diligence. Lord, would you give him grace now? Would you, Father, guide and direct his every word that we would hear from you today, Lord? Use him as a vessel. Use his voice, Lord. Use his preparation. Use it all for the glory of your name, the good of your people. Lord, help him to expound your word and your words only that we might hear from you today and walk away a changed people. We thank you, Father, for this great, gracious opportunity. And we pray it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Children, you, you're dismissed. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. We're going to pick up with verse 27. Where Jesus heals two blind men. One of our songs this morning, we sang this, show us who you are. Fill us with your heart. We will put our trust in you alone. That's been my prayer all week long, that Jesus would reveal himself through this text and that he would open the eyes of our hearts to behold him and just marvel, just marvel. But I'm not sure you noticed who wrote To God Be the Glory. Did you notice who the author was of that song? Somebody wrote this, and I quote, this is another song that that author wrote. The song Blessed Assurance is one of the most popular songs in the Christian church. It was written in 1873, and it was sung right away in the church that very same year. The hymn was inspired by the life of the Apostle Paul and his consistent faith and steady work. The hymn was written by, does anybody know? Fanny Crosby, the world's most published hymn writer and who was blind. Not sure you know her story, but after she was born, Fanny caught a cold that settled in her eyes. Her parents took her to a doctor who applied a mustard base ointment. It did not cure the affliction. It actually damaged Fanny's optic nerve, leaving her blind. Later, the doctor was discovered to be a fake and was banished from practicing medicine. As for Fanny, this person writes, her blindness did not paralyze her. She went on to become the most prolific hymn writer the world has ever known. She wrote, listen to this, I didn't think it was this high. She wrote over 9,000 hymns, 9,000, and of course her most famous being Blessed Assurance. Now, could you imagine being blind your entire life because of a quack doctor? I wonder to myself, did she ever wrestle with anger? against that man, or at least her parents in the beginning, because she was an infant, obviously, probably didn't know any better. And yet, the Lord Jesus Christ saved her and gave her such spiritual eyes to see his incredible glory and beauty through the eyes of faith, through the eyes of faith. And now, of course, we know that she sees him face to face. 
with physical eyes because she's in glory. But as I was thinking about this whole thing, if you remember last week, you remember how I began the sermon? I said, don't you wish that Jesus was around sometimes so that you could just go to him and ask him to heal somebody? I thought to myself, wouldn't it be nice that Jesus was around when that poor little infant girl went blind from a quack doctor? You could just chase Jesus down and say, Master, oh, this poor little infant girl, would you come? Would you come please and heal her? She's blind. Now, as we transition into the text about blindness this morning, I want you to hear this. Jesus Christ is the only one who has ever healed the blind the way that he did. There are some things that I learned this week that just blew me away, like this. There are no instances in the Old Testament where somebody was healed of blindness. Nowhere. Nor are there any instances of healing the blind after the Gospels and after the Lord Jesus Christ. And then there's more. Somebody noted that out of all of the miracles that our Lord Jesus did, the miracle of healing the blind outnumbers them all. And of course, you know what I'm asking. Why? Why isn't there any more instances of healing the blind in the Old Testament or after the Lord Jesus Christ left the earth. We know that he gave prophets the power to do incredible miracles in the Old Testament, like parting the Red Sea, Elijah raising the dead. And we also know that he gave the apostles similar powers to do miraculous things, but no healing of the blind. And I'm asking the question, why? Why? And so here's my answer. I'm thinking the answer is the same reason Jesus did every other miracle in the Bible, the primary reason, and yet at the same time this miracle was considered in the ancient world to be the greatest miracle of all, even greater than raising the dead in their minds. And so why did the gospel writers emphasize this miracle? And I believe that you know the answer because I have been hammering on this because Matthew's main point of his gospel is to show the world that Jesus and only Jesus is the divine Messiah of God who has the power of God. That's the point of Matthew. And so this morning, he's going to show us how Jesus and only Jesus has the authority over disabilities like blindness and authority over the devil who can afflict us in so many ways. And I believe, brothers and sisters, we really need to believe this with every fiber of our being because something else that we're going to notice in the text this morning that we've seen in other places is how much Jesus wants us to trust him. Trust him. Take him at his word and believe in him. It's incredible what the blind men are going to say this morning about the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to understand something. How massive this moment is. Why? Because only God Almighty has the prerogative oversight. The Old Testament in Exodus 4, chapter 11, it says, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? And the answer is unequivocally, yes. It is you and only 
You alone, Lord, who makes man's mouth, makes him mute, deaf, seeing, or blind. And then I apply that to our text this morning. What does Matthew want us to see? The prerogative of God to undo that and to show us that only the divine Messiah, who is God himself, can come and reverse this that was prophesied and predicted in the Old Testament. I've read this verse before, Isaiah 35. It says, then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. He's talking about the coming of the incredible divine Messiah of God who is going to heal, reverse. And it's only Jesus. It's him. He's it. He's the only one who's ever done this. This is incredible. So you ready? You ready to watch him work? This is incredible. Gives us hope. These two blind men come with incredible hope that Jesus is the one and he can heal. Look at verses 27 through 30. As Jesus passed on from there, we'll start with this. Two blind men followed him, crying aloud, have mercy on us. They're crying, have mercy on us. Son of David. And so after Jesus raises the little girl from the dead like we saw last week, he leaves the house and as he's walking along the road, two blind men followed him, it says. Now, my question is, how did they do that? They're blind. That's my first question. I'm entering the text. I'm trying to figure it out. Maybe they had walking sticks or friends who helped them. My guess is the people around them are talking about the Lord Jesus and what he just did, raising the girl from the dead. This is spreading like wildfire. And they might be blind, but they can hear They can hear these reports. I love what Spurgeon said. He said it this way, not talking about hearing. He said, they might be blind, but they can believe. And so being of the Jewish nation, they believed in the Messiah to come. They're hearing reports of this incredible man who is doing mighty miracles. And I I have no doubt people are asking, is he the one? Is he the one? And they seem to believe this. Man, put yourself in their shoes. If he can raise the dead, I wonder if they're talking to each other. I bet he can heal us. I bet he can heal us. Let's get his attention. (laughs) You can only imagine the noise and the crowd. And so these blind men, they're blind. They can't see him. They don't know where he's at. So they cry out. Wouldn't you do that? I don't know where he is. But let's get his attention. They cry out, have mercy on us, son of David. Now that is an incredible declaration. Incredible declaration to make about a man. This man, Jesus. Many times in the Bible when we see the words, have mercy on us, it means to have mercy on me, a sinner. Forgive me of my sin. Here, I think it means from these two men, have mercy on us and heal us of our blindness. We want to see. We want to see. But as we look at this and their cry, we see that there's two things that they believed about the Lord Jesus. Number one, that he's merciful. He's merciful. He's merciful and he's kind. And we all know that about our wonderful Savior, don't we? Number two, that he's the son of David who has divine power. So number one, they believed that the Lord Jesus was merciful. They heard the reports. He's been healing every disease and every affliction. It says way back in chapter 4. We've already seen a bunch of of wonderfully merciful miracles in chapters 8 and 9. And so they believe, they believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is a merciful healer. 
He's kind to the people. And he cares for them. This word mercy actually means to show pity. To show pity for people. And Jesus did that all the time. Helping people. Loving people. Healing people. And that is showing mercy. And so they believe that the son of David, the king, Messiah, is a merciful king. And we can all say, thank you, Jesus, for being a God of mercy and a merciful king, which is point number two. Son of David. They believed he comes from the line of David. I've explained this before, how the Messiah was to come from his line. If you want to read that at home on your own, Places like 2 Samuel 7, where God promised that one of his progeny are going to sit on the throne. And at the same time, God told him that he's going to sit on your throne forever because he's my son. So we got the son of David and we got the son of God. And they believe this. These two men believe this. The Messiah to come is going to be a merciful Messiah who has pity on his people. And the Messiah to come is also the son of David and son of God who has the power of God. Now, to what extent they truly believed everything about the Lord Jesus Christ, I don't know. I don't know yet. But they believe enough to cry out at the top of their lungs, Have mercy on me, son of David. And before we see how Jesus responds or doesn't at first, I just want to say this. And something that we all affirm, how true this is, that our Savior and Lord and Creator is extremely merciful. He's so merciful And I also want to remind you that Jesus is one with the Father, and that means the Father is merciful. And He's one with the Spirit, and the Spirit is merciful. You know what that means? God is merciful. He's so kind and compassionate. David wrote things like this in the Psalms over and over again. I am in great distress. Let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercy is great. He says again elsewhere in the Psalms, great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. And brothers and sisters, we know this. When we cry out to him for mercy, he will hear us. He will hear us. David, again, give ear to my prayer, O God. Hide not yourself from my plea for mercy. I love the Lord because he's heard my voice and my pleas for mercy. Brothers and sisters, when you cry out to God Almighty, he hears you. He hears you. And his heart is bent for you in mercy. Even though it might seem like he's not listening. He hears you as we're about to see. This is so interesting to me as I'm reading this. Jesus doesn't respond to them right away. He doesn't like he normally does. We saw him last week. Oh, my word. When Jairus comes in, he interrupts Jesus in the midst of his teaching. And Jesus stops. And Jesus responds. And he leaves with them. And here, he doesn't. Do you notice that in the text? They're out on the road. They cry out to the Lord, and he doesn't respond immediately. We see him entering the house in verse 28 without responding to their cry. And I'm asking myself, why? Why doesn't he respond right away? I think there's three reasons for this. We're told these things in the Bible. Number one. They said, have mercy on us, meaning heal us, son of David. Heal us of our blindness, just like you healed the leper and the lame and the diseased and you raised the dead. Heal us, have mercy on us. And yet, I think within our Lord Jesus, he loves to heal. He has compassion, 
But at the same time, I don't think our Lord wants people to come to him just to be healed of temporary things. One person said it at the pastor's conference that all of us just went to in North Carolina. You know what he said? He said, when people use Jesus, they'll end up leaving Jesus. It's true. Got my temporary blessing. Don't need you anymore. So they leave. We see this all over the Bible. Secondly, they're crying out, have mercy on a son of David. Everybody knows what that title means. Is it a Messiah? Is it a Messiah? And so two things about that. People would have been politically charged. We were told the Messiah is going to come. He's going to conquer. He's going to conquer the Romans. He's going to put Israel back on top again. And we read in the Gospel of John how people tried to force him to be king. Do you remember that? He didn't want any part of it. He, he left. Because that's not the reason he came the first time around. And I think lastly, he knows that when this thing goes public, when he does want everybody to know that he's the Messiah, he knows that this is going to go south really quick with these people because of the Pharisees that charge him with blasphemy and they crucify him. And it's not his time yet for that. Actually, we're going to start celebrating that next week. Palm Sunday. That's what he wants everybody to know. It's leading up to his crucifixion. So I think that's why he waits until he gets into the house here to address their need. And somebody said maybe to test their faith. Which is what we see in verse 28. When he entered the house, the blind man or men came to him. And Jesus said to them, Do you believe? Do you believe that I'm able to do this? And so we watch our Lord Jesus. Doesn't respond until he enters the house. But I don't want you to miss this. The blind men never gave up. Right? He didn't say anything. Man, we cried out. He went into the house. He didn't even acknowledge us. Let's give up. Let's go. And then one theologian said, I think this here might give us a clue to what saving faith really is because the Father is doing a work in them and He is drawing them to the Lord Jesus Christ. So there is something about determination. There is something about desire. There is something about persistence. That the Father is drawing these two men to Jesus, and they are not giving up. John MacArthur, he saw this, and he said, man, this was a genuine, heartfelt, desperate, seeking faith. Think of the paralytic whose friends, I mean, they tore a hole in the roof. The synagogue ruler's desperate plea and belief that Jesus can raise his daughter, even though his colleagues despise Jesus. And the servant said, don't bother him anymore. But Jesus said, believe. And the woman with the hemorrhaging getting through the crowd just so she can touch the hem of his garment. This is sincere seeking faith. Just like these two blind men had who Jesus wanted to test by asking them, do you believe that I'm able to do this. He knew what they wanted. He knew it. To be healed of their blindness. He heard them cry out. He heard them. Have mercy on me, son of David. And so I think he's essentially asking them, do you believe that I am the promised one of Isaiah 35? Since you called me the son of David, who can heal the blind and the mute. Do you believe? Do you believe that I'm that prophesied Messiah? I think he's asking them two things. Do you have faith that I am the son of David, like you say, and that I have the power of God? to heal you of this blindness? It's a huge question, gang. 
Let the question land on you. Because this is the question Jesus always asked. It's the question of all questions that the gospel writers emphasize. Do you believe this? Jesus, even after he spoke with Lazarus' sisters, when he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Even though a man died, yet he lives if he believes in me. Do you believe this? This matters big time to Jesus. And so now he's asking, do you believe that I am able to do this? That I am the one? And their answer is incredible. So we've seen so far, they believe that Jesus is caring, that he's a caring Messiah. They believe that he is the divine Messiah who has the power of God. Third, they they believe that he is the divine Lord. Look at their answer. It's simple. Yes. Yes, Lord. (laughs) Yes, we believe that you're able to heal us of our blindness. But we also believe that you are the son of David who is merciful and powerful. The Lord of the Old Testament. Gang, some people in the New Testament, when this word is used, Lord, it could be master, sir, for somebody that's over you in authority. It can mean that, but they're not using that word Lord in that sense. When they are using this term Lord, it is kyrios. It is the equivalent of the Hebrew Yahweh of the Old Testament that was translated into the Greek and used the same Greek word. Did you follow that? Lord, God, we believe you're the divine son of David. This is why the Lord Jesus stumped the Pharisees when he said this. We're going to get there. He asked them. He said, how is it that David, in the spirit, called the son of David, in Psalm 110, the Lord? He called him son and Lord. Do you remember their answer? They didn't have one. He totally stumped them. And they dared not ask him any more questions. And it's incredible. They didn't answer because they had no idea who this man was standing right in front of them. And yet we, here we have two blind men seeing with the eyes of faith who the Lord Jesus Christ really is. It's incredible. And based on that faith, the Lord Jesus heals them. Look at verses 29 and 30. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, be it done to you. And their eyes were open. I can't imagine this. I've never been blind. Can you imagine a little bit maybe? You've never seen anything. The sky, blue sky, the people around you, everything you're touching, never seen color. And all of a sudden you open your eyes after the man touches you and, oh my word. (laughs) They laid their eyes on the most beautiful sight that you could ever lay your eyes on. Standing in front of you is the Creator, the King, the merciful Messiah, probably smiling. And brothers and sisters, I I said to you in the beginning that we really want to know our Savior's heart. We do not want to just gloss over, blaze over this fact that he touched them. I think this is a gesture of kindness, a gesture of kindness. You want to know why? He didn't have to touch them. We all know that. He could have just said the word. He didn't have to touch the leper when he healed the leper. He didn't have to touch Peter's mother-in-law when he healed her of a fever. 
He didn't have to touch or take the little girl by the hand when he raised her from the dead. I just think this shows us something about his heart. He loves to touch his people and show them his kindness and mercy. We really want to get this. You want to know who our Jesus is? Full of power and full of mercy. Full of power and full of mercy. Do you know that Jesus? Do you know him? Now many of us We've never been healed of blindness, so we don't feel his power in that way. But just think about your conversion. I consider that the greatest miracle on the planet. Think about your conversion. When the all-powerful king of heaven, sitting at the right hand of God the Father, calls you by name, knows you by name, he knows his sheep, and he calls you by name when he brings you to himself. How kind, how merciful, combined with power, (sighs) sends the Spirit of God to open your eyes, make you spiritually alive through the power of the Spirit, to see Him for who He is and all of His glory and what He's done for us on the cross and become born again. He removes your heart of stone, He gives you a heart of... That's power. It's power. That's our Jesus full of mercy and power. Power. Oh, Now, we see something that he does here for these blind men through the faith that they demonstrated, exercised in Jesus. You don't want to miss that. Jesus said plainly, according to your faith, be it done. According to your faith. Now, I do believe that that faith is a gift. We read that in Ephesians 2.8, how faith is a gift from God, saving faith, faith that comes through the power of the Spirit who makes a man see unless a man is born again. He cannot see, our Lord said, but we exercise that faith that is given. And because of that faith, Jesus heals them. Remember reading in the Gospels when he was in his hometown where he, it says, couldn't do any miracles? Now, let me clarify something for you. There's a false teacher out there saying, yeah, he couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. No, he wouldn't do it. He could do anything he wants. But there was a correlation in his hometown. He marveled at their unbelief is what the text says. And that's why he wouldn't do it. But here, here we see them demonstrating, son of David, have mercy on us. Ah. And he heals them. He just heals them. And they see power, mercy again, brothers and sisters. I, I know we're in the church age again when Jesus was around. He's doing all these miracles because the Father was attesting to the fact that He is the divine Messiah that was prophesied and predicted to come, and, and He would show the world that He is that one through miracles. We also believe that He can still do miracles from heaven. We believe that. And so, I've, I've seen Him do physical healings. You've probably seen Him do that. But dare we miss All the power that is coming from heaven, from our Savior, through the Holy Spirit, that is saving people from every tribe, tongue, nation, and language. Saving them from their sins, giving them the Spirit to live a new life. Man, there's power all the time coming from heaven, from our Lord Jesus, to save and change people. Let us see it, recognize it. It's the same Jesus who's still alive. Now, he, tell these, he tells these two blind guys, don't tell anybody. <laughs> 31, but they went away and spread his fame through all that district. 
I told you why before, why he said that, but a lot of commentators said, man, they disobeyed, and I get that, but I, I, I think I would be running around town jumping for joy, wouldn't you? I can see. I can see. And, of course, everybody around you is going to say, how can you see? I know he told me not to tell anybody, but I, I did this man. Amen. And so I think that's probably the reason why we see somebody bringing another patient to Jesus now. Verses 31 through 34, where we're going to see Jesus exercise authority again over the devil. So verse 32, as they're going away, behold, a demon-oppressed man who was mute was brought to him. And when the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke, and the crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Incredible. So here, here's the scene. Jesus just healed the two blind men, probably left the house. They're going on their way. Matthew says, here he says it again. Don't you love it? Behold, <laughs> another story for you. You got to hear this one. A demon-oppressed man who was mute, mute, couldn't talk, kiddos, if you don't know what that means, was brought to him, was brought to him, indicating that this, this muteness was because of the demon. who Somehow, I don't know, shut his mouth or stopped his voice from working. Tells me that the demonic, they can wreak all kinds of havoc on us. And I want you to... I want you to understand something. This word oppressed literally means possessed in the Greek. This man's possessed by the demon in a controlling way, just like the demoniacs. If you remember those two guys, they're possessed by the legion of demons, which means they're on the inside of this man. He's controlling him and influencing him. Because he's not Christ yet. When you become a believer, I want you to hear this. The devil cannot possess you when you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. Because greater is he who is in you than the one that's in the world. And he is not going to cohabitate with the devil. And so this is why we got to get the Greek right and do careful translation work. This literally means possessed. And so we notice that he was brought to Jesus. Do you see that in the text? And I'm asking myself, he's brought. He didn't come of his own accord. Did he want to be brought? I'm thinking, yes, he wasn't fighting back. I'm asking these questions because we don't hear anything about the man's faith in this text. And yet, we see the heart of our Lord have mercy on those who are harassed by the devil. That's our Lord Jesus. So he cast it out. He cast it out because he... He's infinitely more powerful than the devil. Verse 33. When the demon had been cast out, the mute man spoke. That implies Jesus spoke or just told that demon to get out of the man. And you know how this works. Jesus is the infinite creator of sovereign power over the devil and all of his demons. And they always do what he says. Always. Their power holds nothing to the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see the man speaking, speaking. It's incredible, right? He cast out this demon, and the man spoke. Now, can you imagine the question I'm asking next? Yes! What did he say? I want to know what he said. Thank you, Jesus. I'll follow you wherever you go. I ask him in heaven. Here's Matthew's point. He's not so concerned about that. His point is, I want you to know that this man is the divine Messiah. That's what I want you to know and believe. He's the one. That Isaiah 35 predicted 
would heal the blind and the mute. He's it. It's like big fingers everywhere in his gospel. That's all he's doing. He's it. He's it. He's the divine Messiah. He is it. No one else. Even the people get it right. There's only one who's ever demonstrated this kind of power. Look at what they say next. The crowds marveled, saying, never was anything like this seen in Israel. Never. They're just blown away by this man, this ordinary looking man who has all this power and authority. Now, I don't know if they're just referring to the healing of the mute man or if they've heard these reports. He raised somebody from the dead. And the disciples probably said, yeah, I saw him calm the storm. This is Israel, gang. They're familiar with the Bible, the Old Testament. They're familiar with miracles. Parting of the Red Sea, Elijah raising the dead. And yet we've never heard of anything like this. Why? Because it's this man, this man, this man who's doing all of these things. And I am witnessing it right in front of my eyes. And so they marveled. They just marveled. Wouldn't you marvel? Have you seen somebody walking around and healing the deaf and the blind and the mutant raising the dead and calming storms? Fall on your face. <sighs> You're more than a man. Now, here we go. Another group. They get Jesus totally wrong. And I thought to myself, it's because they cannot see. They don't have the eyes of faith to see. Which is the same for the unbelieving world. They're always going to get Jesus wrong. The Pharisees, verse 44, the Pharisees said he cast out demons by the prince of demons. Now, catch, catch it. Did you catch it? They're not denying his miracle. They can't deny it. They were there. They saw it. They saw him heal, cast out the demon right in front of their eyes. So they cannot deny this miracle. But since they are blind, think he's a sham Messiah, he's already come after us about our legalism, plus he's taken all of our people away, we don't like this guy. And so they charge him with an absolutely ridiculous charge. He cast out demons by the power of demons. When we get to chapter 12, they're going to say the same thing. I'm wondering here, I guess he, does, he chooses not to engage them because he's going to let them have it in chapter 12. That's a stupid argument. <laughs> and he tells them why. Why would Satan want to get rid, rid of his power and his influence by casting out his demons? That makes no sense. We're going to get there. It's very important, too, because he's going to talk about the unpardonable sin, which, by the way, none of you here have committed. I'm going to tell you why in a few weeks. I want to leave you with this, gang. Do you know who this man really is? Truly? And do you marvel over him? Sometimes I think in our day and age, we marvel way too much over other things more than him. Marvel. Think in Marvel. Marvel movies. Wow! Blows us away. Can I let you in on a little secret? That's all fake. <laughs> this is not. He is not. Do you know the son of David? Do you know the one we're going to be celebrating here? We go from Isaiah 35, flip the numbers around, to Isaiah 53, the greatest fulfillment of all time, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted, but he was pierced for our transgressions, ours, crushed for our iniquities. 
Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep that before its ears are silent, so he opened not his mouth. He had done no violence. There's no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him, put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. That was for us. You want to talk about mercy and love? The King of kings and Lord of lords left heaven's glory to become like one of us so that he could die for us. Take our sins on himself that he's never felt before and absorb the wrath of God that he's never experienced in all of eternity for us. Do you know? Do you know that son of David? That Messiah? I pray that you trust in him like these two blind men. Trust that he died for your sins, that he loves you, that he cares, that he is so merciful. And then secondly, believer, let me leave you with this. The stuff he's doing right now that we've seen in chapters 8 and 9, he may do some of it in the church age, in our day. But there is a time that he has promised when he comes back He's going to do it all. That means there's there's not going to be anybody blind in heaven. Not one. Nobody with hemorrhaging. Nobody with cancer. And nobody's ever going to die again. How glorious. We should be the most hopeful people on the planet. Father, thank you for your son. Thank you for revealing him through these incredible texts and texts written 700 years before he ever came, that he is the only one who fulfilled. He is the one, Jesus, we declare with these two blind men, have mercy on us, son of David. And we do believe. Yes, Lord, we believe. And so we thank you for who you are in all of your glory. Merciful, and powerful. Isaiah 35, but also Isaiah 53. Thank you for what you have done for us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. You can stand with us if you're able. Uh, We're going to sing Holy, 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 uh, which is out of Isaiah 6. And in the Gospel of John, um, John says that, you know, um, Isaiah was saying these things. He quotes Isaiah, and he says, Isaiah was saying these things because he saw Jesus. He's relating his, uh, his knowledge of his Savior as he walked with him on the earth with Isaiah's uh, seeing him in the temple. I want to read that to us um, before we sing this song, so it's fresh in our minds. This is from Isaiah 6. It says, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And the seraphim called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah speaks a little bit, and then he says, My eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. That's our Jesus. Do you know him? Let's sing of him. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty Early in the morning Our song shall rise to thee the dog. 
What a God we have, don't we? What an incredible God. My mind just went to John 11 when John the Baptist is doubting the Lord Jesus. Jesus brings up Isaiah 35 to help John believe that he's the one. His disciples asked him, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? Jesus answered them, go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight. Mentioned it first. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up. And the poor have good news preached to them. Blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Do you believe? Do you believe I am the one Jesus is asking? And that I am able. I pray that you believe. He's it. There's no other name under heaven which a man can be saved. He said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody gets to the Father except by me. Not Buddha, not Muhammad, not any other religion. Jesus. Father, we come before you. I pray that there is not a soul in this room who doesn't know Jesus for who he truly is. If they don't, I pray that you would open their eyes by the power of the Spirit to see Jesus Christ for who he really is in the Bible. What he has claimed, what he has done, what he has fulfilled, and the apex, the climax of dying on a cross for sinners. I pray that you would make people alive. Lord, would you pour out the Spirit and your power to make people see and believe in a saving way. And then for the rest of us, Lord, we're always wrestling with unbelief. Would you help our unbelief? We believe, help our unbelief, and help us to have great hope because there is a day when we're going to watch you. We're going to watch you firsthand take care of all of this. Do away with death and disease and mourning and pain. For the old way of things will be gone, will pass away. Behold, I'm making all things new. We can't wait for that day. Lord, may that hope always be in our hearts. And all of God's people said, amen. Love you. See you next week. If you like prayer, we would love to pray with you. We have a couple of folks down here that would love to pray with you. Hey, boss.